So in the previous video, I went into great detail on tipping points in the climate system, highly nonlinear elements of the system that once changed can be irreversible and can change the complete dynamics of the atmospheric circulation, ocean circulation, um, the biosphere, um, the cryosphere, change basically everything on, on, on the planet. So I'm talking about the, le the recent US report um, which is uh, Climate Science Special Report, Fourth Climate Assessment, Chapter 15 in particular, The Potential Surprises, Extremes and Tipping Elements in the Climate System. So there's many components that interact in complex ways. So one of the problems with science is you break things, uh, you divide and conquer. You, in order to learn something, you divide it up, isolate it from the system and just study the heck out of it to advance knowledge. But that's not good enough to address in climate change. We need to consider all of the pieces of the climate system and how they connect together. Okay, so there's negative feedbacks in the system. They're self-stabilizing, okay, but there's not many of them, unfortunately. These would dampen changes that occur. Okay, it would render, it, think of the negative feedbacks as you're stuck in the bottom, in, in, in the valley of a hill, it's hill all around you, you know, you're a, a, you have a ball there and if you push the ball any direction it's going to return back to the lowest point so this is a stabilizing feedback like a negative feedback positive feedback is the balls on top of a hill you push it a little bit in any direction and it goes barreling down the hill and accelerates in speed and takes off you know to a different region of space this is a positive feedback taking you to a different state okay positive feedbacks they magnify both natural and anthropogenic changes Okay, so some components such as Arctic sea ice and the polar ice sheet may exhibit thresholds beyond these self-reinforcing um, cycles. So it can drive the system into a new state. Um, okay, let me just figure out how to, here, okay. Okay, um, so an example is given um, so, you know, we're, our combustion of fossil fuels, widespread deforestation, putting, building up greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, um, is changing the heat balance on the planet, more heat is, is trapped in the atmosphere, so we're getting the warming, the, 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 the uh, warming distribution on the planet is changing, which changes the circulation patterns of the atmosphere and oceans. Okay, so the report, you know, chapters 1 to 14 talk about all of these different changes. Okay, now, climate model projections give insight into possible future changes. Okay, um, you run the model many times, but you can only model things that you know about and components of the Earth system that you know about. So all of the interactions are not included in these models. There's many unknown processes that are not in these models. So these models are consistently underestimating temperature changes during periods of the past, during warm paleoclimates. So therefore, they're underestimating that, they're very likely to underestimate, in fact, they are underestimating the changes that we're seeing today. This is why you read climate change studies, something new is happening with the climate, um, and it's always faster than expected. And this is exactly why. We have a complete 100% reliance on climate models and completely ignore the IPCC I'm talking about, the US report I'm talking about, completely ignoring the observations of how the Earth system is changing and what happened, how quickly it changed in the past in the paleo records. So scientists have been surprised by the Earth system many times in the past. Okay, so the, the example of, of the ozone hole for example. Okay, CFCs were, are chemically inert, or they're thought to be chemically inert. The problem is, is that up in the stratosphere, they were broken down by ultraviolet light, and the chlorine um, would take out ozone. So we got stratospheric ozone depletion. So within 11 years of, of this work saying that they're completely chemically inert, we started getting ozone holes in the spring in Antarctica driven by the chlorine from the CFCs. So this problem moved from being an unknown unknown, okay, to a known known. And by 87, the Montreal Protocol, so we just had the 
basically the 30th anniversary of it, um, it was adopted to phase out these ozone depleting substances. Another good example is Arctic sea ice. Okay, um, the, you, you lose ice, the Arctic gets darker and darker, absorbs more heat, you lose more ice, and you get a vicious feedback cycle and an exponential decline in sea ice. It's not just sea ice, it's snow cover um, around the Arctic Ocean. Okay, um, 2007 was a huge drop. Um, 2016 was uh, a record low. Okay, and uh, so, so the sea ice is going, and they're talking about the date of an ice-free Arctic summer is being moved forward in the models to mid-century, 2050. But declines in 2016 was the lowest. Also, the 2017, it didn't form properly in the winter, lowest on record, suggests that climate models are still underestimating. They're missing relevant feedback processes. You know, one or more, you know, whether it be melt pond, changes in storminess, ocean wave impacts, warming of near surface waters, whatever it is, it's making, it's taking out the ice way faster. So this whole chapter is about potential surprises. Okay, um, there's connections between extreme events. So comp that's where the compound extreme events comes in. So an event on their own might do certain amount of damage and then you combine them and the sum is greater than than the the, uh, the 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 result is greater than the sum of the separate events so these events can occur simultaneously or they can happen in rapid sequence for example if you pair droughts and intense rainfall if you get intense rainfall in the spring in a region you get tremendous vegetation growth and then you get a drought in the summer, all that vegetation dries out, there's lots of fuel, you can get these huge wildfires. So you get a cascading of events here. And these droughts can also last decades. Okay, and another surprise comes from these self-reinforcing cycles or tipping elements. So there, there's multiple states and you can tip between these dates by the forcing. So for example, the ice sheets going vanishing a change in the ENSO becoming much more powerful and no more La Nina, but mostly El Nino state or ocean circulation like the Merinal overturning circulation pattern changing, Amazon rainforest turning into grassland. Okay, so these are some of the known unknowns if you like, but the paleo record suggests that there's unknown unknowns and I'm going to talk about some of those. Okay, so current climate models, they underestimate what happened if you try to run them in the past to simulate what happened in the paleo record, you come short. The changes that were observed and determined from the climate properties are a lot worse than what the models say for that. So we can't trust the models for saying what's going to happen in the future too, too much. So one of the things is there's these low probability, high impact events. So if you have a probability curve, these are things with low probability in the tail of the curve. We can talk about the fat tail of the curve, um, the tails of the probability distribution function. So we also, when things happen, we need to, we detect them, we need to attribute them, okay? If all these extreme weather events are happening and they're not attributed to climate change, then one, the public uh, thinks, oh, you know, what's going on? You know, the other thing is they don't, uh, are, they're not too worried about climate change because they don't realize the implications of climate change in causing those extreme weather events. So those are very useful studies. Um, and there's, there, there's outliers like the Boulder, Colorado floods, the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. These are extreme events, their magnitude and it was unprecedented in the observational record. So when you use statistical approaches like extreme value theory, um, you, you can say that, you know, it's a one in a thousand year event, right? Flood, that would have a flood event with 0.1% chance of occurrence in a given year, but this assumes stationarity of the climate system and we're, we clearly don't have stationarity of the climate system. So what was a one in a thousand year event a decade ago it might only be a one in 200 year event now and in five years it might be a happen every year or every 10 years. Okay, this is the problem. This, the system is changing. You don't have stationarity. Okay, um, so now we need to look at the paleo records to see what happened. And what it shows is that we had these mega droughts, long lasting mega droughts that were similar to but more intense and longer lasting than the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. 
Okay, now the models are based on physics rather than observational data. They're not constrained to a given time period. Okay, so they're used to study the Earth in the distant past, but and, and then they go into the future to try to make projections, but they're missing these small probability high-risk events, and they're missing the tipping points, and they're not accounting for even some of the things like methane coming up in the Arctic, which is absurd when you think about it. Stuff we don't know in the climate models can be set up, can be so-called parameterized. Okay, you give the value a limit between a certain range and you run the model with all those ranges and try to get an understanding. Okay, um, so, the, so permafrost isn't in the models, um, right? And uh, th so the models are under predicting rather than over predicting things. So, you know, if everything's under predicted, then there's a big problem. And compound extremes or cascading events, okay? Those aren't properly modeled. For example, the 2009 Australian floods, you got huge growth of vegetation. Then you got droughts and the stuff died, the vegetation died and dried out, then you have massive wildfire causing tremendous damage. We've seen this a lot of places. We've seen this in Europe, we've seen this in Canada, we've seen this all, all over, all over. Okay, so the net impact of these events is actually less than the sum of the, if you sum the events together, some, sometimes events can cancel out, right, to reduce the effect, but when they add together, you can they, the cascading effect makes the final result worse than if you took them separately. Okay, um, so flooding from coastal storms and river flooding at the same time from snow melt can, can simultaneously add up the water levels to get maximum flooding. Changes in the ENSO circulation patterns and the ridge, like the ridiculously resilient ridge ridge off California, the huge water temperatures off California killed a lot of the marine life and uh, made the jet streams very wavy and ridge and contributed greatly to the California drought. Um, you know, there's different hot spots that are in, um, you know, biological and uh, temperature wise. Um, so you get, can get mutually reinforcing uh, cycles from individual events, you know, for example, you know, drought and heat combined, of course, it takes all the moisture out of the soil in water limited areas. So, so the probability of these events changes as the underlying climate changes. There's no, like, th there's no stationarity in the climate so that you can throw the statistics out. Okay, so, um, for example, you know, the occurrence of warm and dry or warm and wet conditions, you know, where they happen. Um, that's changing, uh, you know, hot summers, heat waves, drought regions, surface drying, etc. Uh, you know, heat drought, southern Great Plains of 2011, or the California uh, drought, um, and this affects uh, food supply, growth of food, and so on. Okay, so these things are all connected and compounded. Um, Variability is changing. One year the Mississippi will be record flood levels, the next year record drought, then back to record flood levels. I call this, you know, weather weirding or weather wilding or, you know, you're, you're, you're in the climate casino. If you luck out in the climate casino, your, your city gets taken out and flooded. Look at Houston, look at the Caribbean islands. Um, you know, and these things also radically feed back on the climate. So the Fort McMurray fires in May 2016 in Canada, Okay, the amount of carbon dioxide produced by these fires was more than 10% of Canada's annual emissions. Okay, um, and here's another example of compounded events. The flooding from wet conditions from precipitation or snow melt exacerbated by warmer temperatures, higher groundwater levels, saturated soils, elevated river flows, carries through to the months later. Okay. Um, so the compound events can occur, they, they can be stronger, longer lasting, and more widespread than those seen in the observational record, and they're not caught in the models. You know, like simultaneous drought across different agricultural regions across the country or around the world will challenge the ability of human systems to provide food. We don't have enough food stored, okay? We've got to start preparing for some of these things. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, basically, so I'm going to continue this in, in another video. Thank you.